Hello, everyone, and welcome to Securing the Digital Supply Chain. Do you trust your devices? I'm Paul Asadorian, the Principal Security Evangelist for Eclipsium, and I'll be your presenter for today. How can we trust what we can't see? Often we use the analogy of the iceberg, this one happens to be a very famous iceberg, and how most users, administrators, and other personas within your organization most often see things like applications. But maybe some may see the operating system level stuff. Most users may not go to that level. But the underlying layers, the software or firmware that enables your hardware that uh, other components such as drivers and bootloaders may also fall into this category of software and firmware that operates well below the visibility line, if you will, that most people just don't see. And it's tough to defend your organization. It's tough to update things that aren't in the spotlight and aren't on your radar. So as we dig into some of the different layers that exist on our devices that we have to trust if we're applying a zero trust strategy or trying to secure our organization in any fashion, we have to trust what is on our computers, what is within our computers in order to have security all the way up the stack through your applications. So if we look below, we have your uh, embedded firmware operating systems, your firmware, your hardware. I would also uh, kind of also include some of those operating system components as this attack surface that is often overlooked in many organizations. When I start thinking about the digital supply chain attack surface, I want to further drill down into all of these components as some of these terms are interchangeable uh, and have different meanings to different people. So let's get some of the uh, vernacular and I think lay of the land in terms of what your attack surface looks like for your digital supply chain. Over on the left, we have your physical access, your physical components that you have to trust that if they're in your computing devices, that they have some security in the supply chain that got them all the way to your doorstep. Now, oftentimes, I believe that there's much less, uh, there's reduced visibility when you're looking at the physical controls of your computers and your computing devices, which makes it harder to validate those supply chain elements. In other words, in order to fully validate that the hardware I've received in my organization hasn't been tampered with, as an example, I pretty much have to open up the device and look inside and make sure I don't see something like what's depicted there with little wires hanging off it and soldered to little traces on the board. Now, that's just one level of validation. There are other levels of validating that the hardware says what it is. Uh, and there's been research, of course, hunting for backdoors in counterfeit Cisco devices was a great uh, piece on this particular topic. But validating the physical supply chain oftentimes has uh, a different challenge associated with it than when we get to software. I want you to think of <clears throat> when you get a computing device of some kind that there is pre-installed software on that device. Most often, the most popular category of pre-installed software is firmware. And this is the software that comes on your devices and many of the components within your computer, and it comes pre-installed from the manufacturer. As we move slightly up the stack, you have bootloaders, kernels, and operating systems. All I put in the pre-installed category as you typically would not run <clears throat> a computer without an operating system. In order to enable the operating system, you have to have things like a bootloader and a kernel. And those are lower level, lower level components that are often not visible to the user. Now, administrators may work at that level as well, but most of the time, this is software that's just enabling the function of your computer so that you can get to applications such as third-party applications that are extremely popular today that users would recognize as, oh, when I use a computer, I use Zoom to communicate with people, I use a web browser, and I use Slack <clears throat> as my chat application. As we move further um, to the right, we see software developed in-house. And that's 
a very hot topic today, your software supply chain. And typically what they're referring to is software that you are developing as an organization or an individual, and you're using components from other people's software, things like Python and node packages from NPM and other people's Docker containers that they've put together. And as we look at this scale of validating your physical supply chain from pre-installed software and firmware, third-party applications, and ultimately software you develop in-house, as we move from left to right, you as the uh, responsible party for all of this software, if you will, the consumer of it, have increased customization and control. All the way on the right, you can choose to use different Docker containers. You can choose to write a library on your own and not rely on someone else's software library to um, provide some function within your application. As we start moving left, we get less and less customization and control. Certainly on the hardware side, the hardware is what it is when it's delivered to me. On the firmware side, there are certain restrictions where you have to rely on your OEM to provide you with up-to-date, secure, and functioning firmware. Oftentimes, you can't modify that yourself. Similar to third-party applications, sure, there are alternatives where there may be much fewer alternatives when we talk about firmware. Certainly with third-party applications, you have a little bit of control. You could switch to Skype as opposed to Zoom and things of that nature or Microsoft Teams. So you've got a little more options in third-party software. So the point is you're, you're stuck with a lot of the stuff that leans heavily to the left in this, in this diagram. And you have to be able to validate the supply chain and take note of that because you're going to rely more on upstream providers in your supply chain to fix those issues. The supply chain is very complex when we talk about just PC servers and laptops. All the way in the upper left-hand corner, we have the CPU or primary chip manufacturers, AMD and Intel, typically providing your CPU. I mean, all their chips as well, of course, but well-known for their CPUs. They have to have agreements and arrangements with uh, motherboard or mainboard manufacturers, Gigabyte, ASRock, Supermicro. And then the motherboard manufacturers have to work with the software providers, such as Inside, Phoenix, or AMI, that provide them with certain levels of firmware, or UEFI, typically. That has to be integrated um, into uh, what becomes your PC. Typically, HP, Dell, or Lenovo is going to start integrating all of those components together. This involves a very complex process of interoperable hardware, software, firmware, many different developers that have different roles and responsibilities in this process in order to deliver you an end product where all these components are working uh, in a, a harmonious manner to provide you with your ultimate PC. There's a lot of opportunities for mistakes, for vulnerabilities to be introduced. There is a supply chain for things like certificates, cryptographic hashes, to make sure that the hardware, firmware and software that's on your computer hasn't been tampered with um, and that other people can't tamper with it after it's been delivered to you if they gain physical access or gain remote access and gain a high level of privilege on your device. So there's certainly uh, the complexities of the supply chain make it very challenging to secure. There are things such as vulnerabilities, which I mentioned, which is one major category, a vulnerability in software or firmware of those devices or components that make up your computer could contain vulnerabilities. Now, they could also contain backdoors as well. Someone could put something in on purpose that introduces a backdoor into the system at any point in the supply chain. Then we also have tampering. Tampering of these devices that maybe allow an attacker later on down the line to introduce a vulnerability or backdoor. Um, tampering of the actual firmware such that uh, it contains things like backdoors or uh, other access mechanisms or uh, preserves a vulnerability throughout the supply chain. 
And these can happen at all different points from component suppliers to subsystem compliers, uh, suppliers rather, down to OEMs and uh, right before, even after the value added reseller, right before the customer receives this system. This is why we must validate what we get. Our systems do not come to us in a perfectly secure state. <clears throat> there is a lot of things that happen to uh, get to the point where you receive a fully functioning device. And that doesn't mean that it's secure. Sure, there's a lot of security processes and validation steps that happen, but there's also a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong. And when things go wrong, what happens? Well, you've got your CPU manufacturers, your operating system vendors, your OEMs, your BIOS providers, even the open source community, in addition to component suppliers, and they're all pointing the finger at them uh, at each other because it's a very complex process to go, well, there was a vulnerability, something was compromised, someone needs to revoke a certificate or hash somewhere, well, whose job is that? And if I apply a firmware update to this component, that has a dependency on your component, and you have to update your component firmware so that I can update my component firmware so that can we can release a patch to the customer or consumer. And oftentimes what happens in these more complex situations is everyone just points the finger at themselves, and we're left waiting for some kind of remediation for a vulnerability or exposure or threat that's in the wild while the manufacturers and entire supply chain has to work together rather than point the fingers at each other in order to fix the problem. Attackers prey on these weaknesses and have for some time. I start and you can visit the the link this is on our blog. It's a it's a great uh, blog post and I've kind of I've added the most recent edition as well, which I'll get to, but this starts in 2011. This is that that's actually a master boot record BIOS uh, only uh, style attack called Mibromi. All of the other attacks that you see on here are attacks against specifically UEFI. So this does not include attacks against firmware on things like network devices, which happen all the time. It does not include attacks on other components within your computer, which happen as well. These are attacks that are going after UEFI. And you can see there's a, a very rich history of these attacks of different pieces of malicious software that have specifically tried to attack UEFI to gain that high level of privilege on that device to either gain persistence or be able to destroy the device. Black Lotus is the latest example. That was a bootkit that we saw being sold on online forums um, on the hacker, air quotes, hacker underground, if you will. It was being sold on these uh, various forums and touted as a, a bootkit or piece of malware that can bypass secure boot and infect the operating system uh, at a very low level. Turns out this was true. It was analyzed um, and uh, it, it has been found in the wild. It's one of the first times we've seen in the wild malware with the capability to bypass UEFI secure boot. I want to take a moment and describe the UEFI level of privilege on your computers. Now, this takes a lighthearted approach to describing that level of privilege. I recently, you know, very, very high level describing UEFI firmware as all of those things that happen once you push the power button on your computer, um, the very early stage things happen, UEFI goes through a very complex process of enabling all of the hardware and um, through firmware, enabling all of the hardware on your system to power on, to initialize, uh, ultimately culminating in the handoff of the UEFI firmware to the bootloader. Now, in this case, it happens to be Grub2. Of course, Windows uses a different bootloader, and that bootloader passes it off to the kernel, and the remainder of your system processes follows from all the way to the time you get to a login prompt or maybe open up a web browser and maybe look at some Linux memes. So when an attacker gets access to the UEFI subsystem, they have control over 
all of those very early boot stage processes. And this allows them to not only implant malware on your system, but bypass operating system controls at a very low level. So your EDR and uh, your patching process and all of those monitoring mechanisms that are running within your operating system can be bypassed or turned off by attackers with those early stage uh, and higher privileges at early stages of the boot and initialization phases. And firmware is really just software. I use the terms kind of interchangeably. It's often firmware that's difficult to program. And I say that in a joking manner, and, and people usually you know, laugh at this kind of statement, and especially anyone who's worked with firmware. What's interesting is that, like most other software, and I think even more so with firmware, because of the restrictions, the size restrictions, the limited capacity that firmware is running in, it tends to lend itself to have more security vulnerabilities and configuration issues, and also less protections as well. Now, many don't believe me that firmware is vulnerable, that it comes pre-installed on all of our systems, and this should be a problem that is addressed by the component manufacturers, by the OEMs, so they're delivering us a more secure system when it arrives at our doorstep. The problem is when you get a device <clears throat> that's delivered, which manufacturer has done what steps in the supply chain for which component that's inside of your computer. We've got CPUs and microcode updates that need to be applied. We've got the management engine and those chipsets that not only participate in the initialization and security of your system, um, but also will allow for remote management. Network cards, BMCs are specialized management devices built into many devices, especially servers. Embedded controllers, RAM, memory, your hard drives, all have some components on there that run some type of firmware. I want to focus a little bit on the UEFI aspect of that and look at some of the data that we have here at Eclipsium as we've been collecting and analyzing firmware, not just UEFI firmware, but lots of different firmware packages, primarily focused on UEFI. And when we collect the software or firmware, we, sh we can do some analysis on it. So this is the largest data set that I have, and I think it really speaks to how firmware is particularly vulnerable. So we've analyzed 138,000 firmware packages. Again, not just UEFI, other firmware as well. We found there exists about 198,000 CVEs across those firmware packages. If you take those 198,000 CVEs and you look at the common CWE, or common weaknesses uh, in enumeration, the most common type of vulnerability is improper restrictions of operations within the bounds of a memory buffer. Essentially, CWE-119 is the classic problem of memory corruption, of things like use after free, buffer overflows, which still plague us today, but certainly plague the firmware that we run on all of our systems today, primarily because it's written in non-memory safe languages, in very small environments, um, running on chips that don't have a lot of storage or other um, types or in a lot of performance as well, which is why it's written in non-memory safe languages such as C. We've also done some, uh, some more updated research in analyzing UEFI firmware. So we analyzed over, just over 15,000 unique devices and these devices have pulled their firmware from the spy flash, which is where the firmware is stored. Uh, UEFI firmware, among other things, are stored on modern computers. Uh, 781 different versions across 335 different hardware models. So these are actual computers, systems running in the wild. And we've been able to analyze the spy flash and the UEFI firmware and environment on these systems. We did security checks on these devices um, <clears throat> while they were running in the wild. In almost every case of all 15,000, we found a firmware-related vulnerability. Now, 
<clears throat> many of these vulnerabilities could be remedi remediated rather with a firmware update, um, but proving that firmware updates are not being applied. Let me show you what you mean. We analyzed a subset of this data and looked for specific vulnerabilities to try to determine a trend of what are some of the more common weaknesses and exposures that exist on systems that we were able to pull the spy flash and do the analysis. One of the things we found is an outdated DBX. So this is the revocation list for software that is vulnerable and should not be allowed to participate in the secure boot process. And we found that a lot of folks are not updating their DBXs. Now what's interesting is the most recent Black Lotus boot kit actually installs a bootloader, a boot manager, boot software, if you will, that uh, introduces that has a vulnerability that allows someone, an attacker, to bypass secure boot. However, if you're not updating your revocation list, that opens up the gamut. It opens up a wider variety of software than an attacker could use to then bypass secure boot. So there's a lot of issues with outdated DBXs out there as well. Um, outdated microcode, <coughs> code running on your CPU was up there as well, as well as various spy issues. Now, spy issues are, are interesting because um, I've got some better examples coming up. If your system is not configured to protect the spy flash, it means an attacker could install code that gains access to UEFI, giving an attacker control of the UEFI subsystem gives them very deep access into your system. Could be very hard to not only detect, but also get rid of as you know, an operating system reinstall is not going to kick an attacker out of your UEFI subsystem. So you can see a little deeper into our research of <clears throat> unique devices that we found and some of the top vulnerabilities. Things like the spy descriptor, that's the insecure spy flash that could give an attacker access to UEFI. We also see BMC default passwords. BMCs often have elevated privileges on your systems as well. And we see, of course, the outdated DBX. Checking my own stuff. That's right. I use Eclipsium's product. I have the luxury of being have a, having access to it to check my own things on systems that I both use and manage. This represents, the screenshot right here represents two systems that I manage that um, provide actually DNS and DHCP for an environment. And these systems have not um, had a firmware update available from the OEM and were shipped with missing protections on the spy flash. Now, as an end user, it's extremely difficult for me to remediate these vulnerabilities. The OEM has uh, certain privileges and in information and settings that they must put in place in order to remediate some of these issues. So as a user, it's um, from a technical level to go in and do this, I might be able to affect some change, but those changes might not be accepted or used by the system requiring the OEM to provide an update to that functionality in order to remediate these vulnerabilities. So I'm basically stuck waiting for the OEM, in this case, who has not produced a UEFI firmware update to remediate these vulnerabilities. So I'm kind of stuck um, <coughs> with this vulnerability on these particular systems. I'll show you how to get um, some better visibility as well. Also, another system that I manage was shipped with Intel ME in manufacturing mode. This allows the manufacturer, or in this case, the attacker, to affect change on the system that could become permanent. These could be programmable fuses that the attacker is able to fuse their own keys into rather than the OEM key. So with some pretty serious vulnerabilities that uh, in states that you're, an attacker could put your system in if manufacturing mode is left um, open. And again, be due to the complexities of all this, you know, firmware, hardware, and software, this is typically not something the user can go remediate on their own.
So let's talk about some of those bad things. We've talked about some of the vulnerabilities that can exist on your systems. Let's talk about some of the bad things. So attackers have some tools at their disposal in order to write your spy flash. Permanently change your system, perhaps. Um, could brick your system. If also you play with some of these tools on your own, you, you could brick your own system. Um, but attackers have things like flash from RW everything that are tools designed to create things and apply updates. But attackers can use that functionality in order to write to your spy flash and affect change on your UEFI subsystem. Or through recent research, could use access to things such as a uh, BMC or management interface in order to cause physical damage. If the attacker's motive and goals are to basically blow up your computer, there are proven uh, research papers such as this one and examples out there of attackers, I'm sorry, of researchers doing just that. So what are the potential solutions? <clears throat> of course, update your firmware. However, those of us that have worked in IT, computers, and computer security for uh, uh, any given amount of time and have come across a firmware update, we know it's not a trivi trivial thing. It's not something to take lightly. Firmware updates can go wrong. Firmware updates could break your system. And <clears throat> applying them requires so oftentimes downtime. So updating your firmware is hard. It's easy for me to sit here and say everyone should update their firmware. This is a hard process that requires a lot of validation planning <clears throat> and making sure you're doing it correctly in order to avoid the operational risk of causing issues or problems with your systems. However, you should still update your firmware. You should also verify the integrity and in the supply chain of third-party software installed on your system. This is firmware, bootloaders, um, all of the, the components that exist at that uh, low level, even up to the high level. But if we just look at the low level things like firmware, our software at Eclipsium is able to monitor the integrity and the supply chain of your firmware and lower level software in a couple of different ways. <clears throat> One, we can detect changes. So when I run into that scenario of my systems that do not have a firmware update, I can use Eclipsium software to go, well, if there is no update from the manufacturer, this firmware should never change. If it does, it could mean that an attacker is attempting to tamper with it or put a back door in it or exploit a vulnerability in it to make changes to it. If that happens, the Eclipsium software notifies me of that. Also, if firmware co contains um, known implants <clears throat> and we detect some known behavior, that is also observed. So um, there's multi also the integrity checking goes uh, deeper into Eclipsium knows that I have version one of this firmware installed on my system. We know because we collect it and analyze it on the back end, we know that firmware version one for that system should look like this. If that firmware on my system doesn't match what we have, um, that will also flag an integrity warning to go, hey, you think you're running that firmware but you're really not. You're running something slightly different, and we can tell you that because we maintain a database of all of that firmware on our back end. Um, a huge thanks uh, to everyone at <coughs> Eclipsium, my coworkers, and many others in the field that are looking into the security of firmware, UEFI, Secure Boot, and all the technologies that I discussed. Our founders and researchers really pioneered and uh, <clears throat> were some of the first to discover and identify a lot of the vulnerabilities that I talk about on a regular basis. Um, so you can read more about that, some of our history and some of the details in a lot of the things I talked about today on our blog, um, including in videos and podcasts as well uh, that I've done with our researchers. And um, a lot of these not only detail the history of some of the research, but talk about the threats and solutions today for things like secure boot, um, writing to your spy flash, and Intel's management engine. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching today.